Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Today my talk is about the four ways of changing the mind, sometimes called the four common foundations. There's also a not so good translation, the four ordinary foundations. It's not so good because they're not at all ordinary. There will be a series of talks on this topic and this first talk is an overview to try to help us understand their place in the scheme of things and their utmost importance in our meditation practice, in particular in our Kaju tradition but in all the Buddhist traditions, especially those of Vajrayana. If you yourself are already practicing them, or if you're about to set out on the practice of these four foundations, then you are probably somebody very, very fortunate indeed, because it means that you've been advised to do so, by your own guru, your, your teacher, and it's probably the start of a very special, very powerful and very meaningful journey of meditation. Let's first look at the names themselves of these four topics. They are called the Four Foundations because they are the very foundation of all Buddhist practice. Sometimes they're called the four preliminaries and this really gives the wrong impression. And so, so often, unfortunately, people think of them as a formality that they have to do first. The ideas behind them about the precious human existence, about impermanence and change and so on, are not that difficult to understand and so people think well I've understood that now I want to go on to the real practice. The Yidam practice, the practice of Mahamudra and so on. They rush them, they don't give them enough time and what happens if that's the case is that no matter how well you practice the various visualizations or meditation techniques that follow, they don't really bring much result. Now, Tibetan Buddhism has been in the West for some 40 years and more, and our teachers have had the time to look back, to think about their disciples, and to think what has gone well and what's gone wrong. And one conclusion so many of them have come to is that people have not really changed as much as they could have done, as they should have done, through Vajrayana practice. Of course, from their own side, they need to wonder, have we given the right teachings at the right time? That probably was the case, but what didn't happen from the disciples' side was that they did not give enough time to the preliminary practices. Either these four common ones, which are really the rock on which everything else is based, those four foundations, or afterwards the four extraordinary foundations for Mahamudra, the prostration practices, and so on. A house without a foundation will never be strong and stable and especially if there are no foundations then things like painting the walls or putting in the electricity makes no sense at all and even if the house has been built if the foundations suffer the foundations are no longer reliable then the entire building can collapse the interesting thing with these four foundations and the reason why they are not just preliminaries 
is that when we look at the teachings of the greatest of masters, the Kamapas, Patro Rinpoche, the Buddha himself, Milarepa, even though they've gone through all of the complications of the various yogas, yidam practices, mandalas, and so on, in the end, their heart advice to themselves, to other people, always comes back to these four major topics. And I think one could very safely say, you've only really integrated them properly, mastered them, when you are yourself enlightened. They are not just things that you can say, okay, done that, it's finished. These will be truths that grow and grow and grow. They are the heart of the practice. So they are the foundations of all the other things we do. They must go in place. The other name that they're given are the four ways of changing the mind. And that is a very, very telling name. Because if the mind hasn't changed, then we haven't done them enough. Ideally, you would do these four contemplations until there has been a huge change of heart. And your relationship with your life with your own body and existence, with your friends in your family, with wealth and power and all the other things of life, romance, will have changed. Your mind will have turned to the Dharma. You will understand the beauty and the meaning of the Dharma for this life and all your future lives. You'll be holding it dearer to your heart than anything else. You will feel, and the term is sick and fed up with samsara. You'll have lost your taste for it. So ideally, we would practice these four ways of changing the mind until this had happened. And it is that changed mind which has shaken itself free from its samsaric habits that really can then shoot ahead with the practices of shamatha, of Mahamudra, with the visualization practices of the Yidam. You see, the problem is that we've been around a long, long, long time. Hundreds, thousands of lifetimes. And we only got this far we got this far, that's already good, but there is so much more to do, and life is so short. So what is it that again and again and again, life after life, stopped us from really flying? It is our addiction to samsara, and our addiction to the mental sleep which is samsara. Months, years, decades go by, and then you're dead. This addiction to samsara is really our worst enemy. We are so used to it. Our relationship with samsara is like sometimes these old couples, you see. In a way, they hate each other. They're always nagging each other moaning about each other, feeling resentful that they have to live together. But you know very well they're never going to leave each other. And somehow they need each other to exist, even though they don't get on so well. I often think our relationship with what we call samsara, an existence of suffering, an existence in which we suffer, is like that. One part of us doesn't like it at all, would like to be out of it, but in another way we are so familiar with it that we haven't got the courage to get out and we'd rather stay in there and suffer because somehow it's a suffering that we've learned to live with, even though it can be 
so painful and so disappointing. The four ways of changing the mind are there to help us shake free from that sleep, to help us deal with the addiction of samsara by changing our mind, the four ways of changing the mind, and by turning the mind away from it in a very hopeful and positive way so that we now long to become the Bodhisattva and the Buddha that we really are. In order to do that, we contemplate these four topics. How rare, how precious our present human life is. We learn to have some objectivity, to see ourselves, how an external being, a Buddha who could see millions, billions of different sentient beings, would see our life with its opportunities and possibilities as an amazingly rare possibility with such potential to do so many things. We don't realize that because we are so used to it. We were born into it, we've grown up in it. In the sleep of it, we don't see what a potential it is. We're like somebody who's got bearer bonds for millions of dollars, but we don't know what they are. So they just look like pieces of paper in a cupboard, like all the other pieces of paper. We don't realize the potential that's there. So we need to wake up to that. The second thing we contemplate is impermanence and how all the things that make up our sleep and our suffering of samsara, our human relationships, our family relationships, our relationship with objects, wealth, power, prestige, our own body, how all of these things are so transient and how definitely at death they'll disappear forever. We'll never see one of them ever again. We'll never be this person we are ever again. We think a lot about death to understand how precious but how precarious this wonderful human opportunity is. And then we go on to think about karma. Karma means what we do. What are we doing with our days? What are we doing with our hours? What are we doing with our lives? And we want to do the very, very best for ourselves, for everyone. And especially today, the world is in such a predicament. It needs more than ever wise, kind, selfless people there to help, there to cultivate the wisdom instead of the greed. So we think about karma and our opportunity to work with our karma, with what we are because of the past and with what we will become later in this life and in our future lives through what we do now with our Dharma practice. And then fourthly, we think of suffering so that we are very, very clear about the nature of the existence in which we live and the other forms of existence, how they come about, and the great sufferings that there are. And this should open our heart in great care for all of our brothers and sisters, the other sentient beings, so that we long to become a Buddha, so we can help them. Now those four ways of changing the minds have very precise and classical sets of teachings, and we will try to get an overview of each one in the talks which are coming in this series. But the information the classical topics, the things that we study, need to be meditated on. And I've noticed lately that some of the teachers I respect the most 
are now asking their disciples to say spend two years on these four ways of changing the mind six months each not just a couple of weeks each or a couple of months but six months each at least so they really sink home you can understand the ideas behind each one very quickly and in particular in the developed world because we grew up with an education many people went to university we're very clever at assimilating information so we can tick the boxes very quickly and understood that understood that but actually it's only your intellect your head that understood this is the problem so far over the last 40 years many people have understood up there but then it has not changed them because they've not taken it from their head into their heart in order to change everything that they are and everything that they are doing. So understanding is not enough. We need to meditate. The concepts that will change us need to be savoured very deeply. So in the next video, which will be, I think, quite a short one, I'll try to explain what in Tibetan is called Tungom. And this is the way we use to actually bring the ideas to life as the Buddha wanted. When we study wisdom, we see there are three steps. First, you get the information. Then you bring it to life, which means that you integrate it into what you are. It changes you. It goes into you, like fertilizer goes into the soil. It changes everything you are. That second step is called reflection. And then the third step, meditation, is where it really takes on all of its strength, all of its power and light to guide us. We need to do that with each topic of the four ways of changing the mind. Otherwise the mind probably won't change. These four foundations are so, so vital. And so we need to give them every chance. And then if they're in place afterwards, everything will be much, much easier. So many of our great lineage masters have said, as one very famous and much quoted one, Lama Zhang, said, the foundations are more vital, more critical than the actual practice of Mahamudra. That's really true. So we need to practice them until we get the signs that they are really working. What are the signs? Well, with the precious human existence, when you wake up every day so happy that you have another day of your precious human life in front of you, that's a sign. When no matter what's happening, when life is going well, or even when life is terribly difficult, you're still so happy to be alive, to have the Dharma, to be in this precious and powerful human existence, to be able to deal with those positive or negative circumstances. Each thing becomes a treasure and somehow you feel you're in the very, very best place to use all of that to the best. These are the signs of the precious human existence. You won't be feeling sorry for yourself. You won't be feeling disappointed by what people do or what they don't do. If you're full of hope and fear concerning the world, your reputation, your human relationships, your family relationships, then you are still not out of samsara. If all of that starts to become much more transient, 
and you just treasure the very fact that you are alive and practicing Dharma. That's the sign you understand the precious human existence. The sign that you've understood impermanence is that you are much less attached than you were to people and to things. You can still love your children, your brothers and sisters, your parents, your companion. You can still love them, but it will be different because you'll know you've had hundreds, thousands of lovers, brothers, sisters, mothers, fathers, children in the past. We can treasure them now, but in a way that no longer clings. You will see everything, fame and disgrace, power and weakness, health and sickness, through same eyes as part of the changing landscape of life. You will be free from the clinging, freer from the clinging. That's the sign of the power of the second contemplation working, impermanence. When you become more and more mindful of your action, careful to use your minutes and your hours positively, doing physically and verbally the best you can, but even if they are small deeds, the mind behind them becomes a pure mind, a good mind a very vast and panoramic bodhisattva mind and you are taking care so that hour after hour what you are doing is meaningful and mindfully done full of awareness that you would never not for anything in the world ever harm anybody any sentient being ever again and including yourself good karma. So when there is that feeling of carefulness, it's a very good sign that your understanding of karma has actually changed you a lot. And then for the understanding of suffering, well, you will again not cling like you used to, to wealth, to power, to other people's praises or blame. There won't be so many fights and conflicts or jealousy and struggles. But more than anything, your heart will be more and more moved by the condition of our fellow humans, of the animals, of the planet, the environment, and of those many, many beings that we can't see in other realms. You'll be longing, aching to do something to help everybody. So when those four things ha have happened, you're so happy to be alive, you understand the impermanence, so careful with your karma, so caring for everybody, then the Dharma is really working on you. You are becoming a true Dharma person and then the special practices, the foundations will have, special foundations will have a lot of power when you do your prostrations, or Dojya Sempa, the other practices, they will bring the results which then make your mind ready for the deep meditations of Vajrayana and Mahamudra. I think that's all I wanted to share with you in this introduction. As I said at the beginning, if you are embarking upon, or you have embarked upon, the four ways of changing the mind. You are one of the luckiest people in this world and I wish you excellent practice and great success. Thank you very, very much. Speak with you soon. Bye-bye.